I'm John Gregg, editor of Farmterio. Compost pack barns have spread across Ontario over the past number of years with mixed results. Some would never go back to stalls, but others can't wait to put them in. What makes the difference between compost pack success and failure? The Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has been looking into it. Christoph Wand, Livestock Sustainability Specialist with OMAFRA joins us. And he's actually just back from a compost barn, pack barn open house. Uh, and he's going to tell us about uh, that and a bit about OMAFRA's research and work they've been doing with compost pack barns. Hi, Christoph, and welcome to Canada's Digital Farm Show. Hello, John, and thanks for having me. So tell me about the, first let's just uh, tell me about compost pack barns. What, what, do, we, what do we mean by we, when we say that? And you could use the example of the, the farm you were out to today. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the debates we have when we're talking about these things is what should we should call them. And I guess I'm a proponent of calling them composting pack barns to give an indication we're talking about an active process. But that's still a debate going on amongst those of us working uh, with these type of barns. And so to that point, the idea is, is that we have a living, heating, composting pack. So this is not your grandfather's uh, bedded pack barn. This is being actively turned, generating heat, killing pathogens. And we're seeing, certainly there are some dairy people in Ontario having great success with them. And then tell us about the, uh, the barn you wrote today. It's kind of a, you know, there's maybe not quite as many new ones going in, but this, uh, there certainly are a few this, uh, this, this, this year I've heard of, and, and this will be one of them. Yeah, I was just at the Sigview open house up at Moorfield here today. Uh, I understand it to be the first brown Swiss herd in North America that has gone to a composting pack barn. They've been active since May, and I have to say the open house was uh, done really well in terms of distancing and so forth. And I went there, not only I was happy to see the pack barn, but I was happy to see the innovation around the agribusiness people finding a way to get small numbers of people through the barn quickly, right down to individually wrapped snacks instead of big boxes of donuts. Uh, so there were snacks to go. So it was pretty good. Uh, they've been in since May, as I said, and it's a tunnel ventilated barn. Two years ago at our workshops, I would have been one of the people who went on the record and said, uh, I thought tunnel ventilation might not work in these barns. But I have to say, I'm really impressed that uh, people have gone ahead and found a way to make it work. Nice, big, bright barn. So where the turkey curtains would be in a regular uh, freestall or composting pack barn, there's acrylic panels. And then the end wall is all large fans. And the other end wall is all the turkey curtains and inlets that you'd normally see on the side wall. So it's pretty cool. And then what, uh, what other systems did they, did they have there? I understand, are they, is that a robotic milking system? Yeah, it is. And I would say with most of the composting packs that we have going in, uh, the majority of people are putting in robots these days. Uh, and we're seeing green, blue, and red robots. And so today was the red Lely robots uh, on site there. So I know Amafra has spent some time, I've, I've seen bits come out here and there uh, on research and looking at uh, you know, success. You had some uh, education seminars on comp composting pack barns. Uh, what, why, why is it something that uh, the, the livestock team at Amafra has, uh, has, has spent some time working on? So we have a variety of motivations as to why we're doing it. And I'll go on the record for myself. I don't want to speak to my other colleagues too much. I think we're all on the same page that we want to help provide the tie stall portion of the industry an alternative. We see it's time that we, you know, we give some innovation and some things for people to look to. And certainly these composting pack barns have offered themselves as an alternative that many tie stall people, people that are cow centric, cow performance, uh, individual cow centric. A lot of them like this bedding uh, system or the composting bedded pack. I like it. So as a sustainability guy, um, there's a lot of really good welfare features around them. Uh, natural postures, cows can lie flat out if they wish. And it's just a really appealing view when you go in the barn and you see the natural behaviors expressed by these cows. We've heard from some people and why we're involved, you know, that these barns won't perform well, you know, that cow production suffers or, you know, milk quality suffers. And frankly, we have some really good operators out there who will demonstrate cow health is right up there, including utter health and uh, milk performance is right up there too. So we've been trying to support uh, the people that are, you know, at the leading edge and going into these barns to do the best job because the critical success factor is the management of the pack. We've got to aerate that pack. We've got to kill pathogens. Uh, we've got to ensure utter health. And to my view, 
the biggest job to do is blow off that moisture that um, the cows are putting into the pack. And uh, so what, what are some of the common success factors for people who manage these well? You mentioned you, know, you could start with that, um, you know, blowing off the moisture on the top of the pack. How, how do people manage that and how does that change? Typically, it does change farm to farm and we're seeing a little bit of variation, but the, the common thing we are seeing, at least with lactating cows, is once or two times a day agitation of the pack, I'll call it. I say agitation because we have some people using PTO-powered rototillers and the farm I was at this morning, they're just using a regular small cultivator behind a smallish tractor, say 70 horse tractor. Uh, so we're seeing variations of that. If you go online, uh, we have a Facebook group for uh, composting bedded pack users. I say we, I'm a member, I didn't start it. You know, you'll see in other parts of the world, people have brought in fully automated systems. And those are things we're talking about. You know, we see these feed pushers and uh, we see these manure suckers. They had one there today, you know, that pushes the manure down the, the slatted floor alley. And that's what I'm hoping for as we see some innovation in this space of, you know, automated compost turners. But right now where everyone, as I understand it in Ontario sits, it's a tractor driven or a um, skid steer driven uh, machinery, either actively turning like a rototiller or a cultivator or a chisel plow, pulling through the pack, mixing it, getting oxygen in, taking advantage of the composting heat and blowing that moisture off. So let's look at some of the, the things that, that uh, some of the questions people have about composted pack sure. barns. Uh, you know, first of all, you want to uh, address uh, utter health that, uh, you know, and, and within utter health, that's your know, mastitis levels and, and those sorts of things. Uh, where has that been a success and where is it a, where is it a challenge? So yeah, the utter health thing, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying I have next to no expertise in utter health. And that's why we're at the point in the project that we're, we're reaching out. And actually now the lead on this may be shifting towards the U of G uh, research teams there. So uh, Rene Bergeron and uh, David Kelton and Derek Haley, we've been in dialogue with them. And there seems to be some interest to put out some formal research. And where we want to go is correlate pack management behaviors. And the behavior I'm talking about is the farmer, not the cow. So pack management behaviors by the farmer and correlating that to somatic cell count, bulk tank measures, lactinet data, uh, robot data for the people that have robots, which again, uh, the majority seem, the people that are going into compost barns, the majority seem to have robots. So we want to get access to that data and we're right in the middle of the process. Uh, David Kelton was actually at the open house this morning too. Uh, and Dr. Kelton, you know, he's made his career at working on utter health. And uh, so we were talking about the, the uh, logistics of getting this data freed up on our pilot project right now uh, between those providers I mentioned and the research team. So from some of your uh, practical experience, what, what, uh, what things do people do? Uh, the people that want to stay with the system and, and like it, uh, I expect there's, uh, well, I had a farmer I know who, who uses compost packs says it's many things that come together to make it work. What, what are, you know, you've talked about the, the, the pack, or are there other things that come together that, that, that make it work? My opinion, and it's dangerous to uh, operate just on opinions, but my observation would be that the people who are having good success with these packs are also good cow managers. And that's not to say the other, uh, the other styles of management aren't cow managers, but what I mean by this is people who are keenly interested in cow behavior versus cow performance. And so the same eyes that let someone be a really good cow manager, and I'm, I'm talking literally about the, the animal entity, um, seem to be good pack managers. You know, they have attention to, you know, is it heating today? You had a previous question and I probably left out a lot of details like, you know, we're adding carbon substrate to this, uh, to this pack quite frequently. Um, and we are expecting it to produce heat. And when they till it on a cool day, there's going to be a big uh, volume of fog. We used to think fog was bad. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think that fog is the visible manifestation of the pack working and blowing off that moisture. So, the people that are really in tune, you know, the same kind of people who can tell a cow is coming sick a day or two before any of the parameters do, are the same kind of people that look at their pack and see something's wrong and needs a little more carbon. That spot over there is too wet. Uh, you know, they see the relationships between the cows lie and where the fans are and where the sun's coming in through the curtains. And the people that see all those things uh, seem to be doing, uh, I think, a better job, frankly. 
And I think it's a skill set we need to work on with the people going into these parts. And I wonder if the uh, the fog might be, uh, you know, if it's a, if it if we assume it's it might it's a good thing if if it might then once it's up in the air it might be dealt with better with a tunnel ventilation barn. It'd be interesting to to have a, to for somebody to have a look at that at some point. Well, and to your point, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. This tunnel ventilation observation, um, yeah, maybe it is the better way to deal with fog. That you know there is a real intersection between the ingenuity of the farm builders and the farmers themselves. Uh, the behavior of the cows and, you know, hopefully some of the advice we can give people has outside eyes and make it work a little better. Can you talk a bit about the, the what you call the carbon substrate, which is basically yep. the, the stuff you put in the pack. These days, uh, finding biomass is uh, more challenging, more expensive than ever. What, what, yep. are, what are people using and is, is, there, is, there a lead, uh, is there one that's leading these days? Well, I'll go back to, uh, you know, I mentioned the U of G people and so, uh, Dr. Rob Gordon, who had been the dean at OAC and went to Laurier and now is president at Windsor. And Rob has maintained an interest in this project as well because of his composting expertise. He would say to you, as he did to our workshops and any of the farms we've toured, uh, sawdust, not not shavings, but sawdust is the gold standard. To your point though, John, uh, we are starting to hear between, you know, COVID, uh, whether it was mill closures or trucking companies logistics, I would argue there's still lots of shavings to be had. Um, there's huge stockpiles of it in some places. Our colleagues at Ministry of Natural Resources and Forests have reported to Tom Wright, my colleague uh, with Amafra, dairy specialist, that there's still mountains of this stuff to be had in Northern Ontario places. But we do have a real logistics problem, right? Getting it delivered, getting it to a farm in the second week in January. Uh, these are real problems. So to that point, uh, we are also as part of our work trying to understand better, you know, how might uh, other substrates like hammer milled straw or finely chopped straw, you know, some off spec corn silage, you know, how might some of these uh, materials work in the pack? Yeah, because sawdust is not free either, right? That's one of the things we've tracked is cost, bedding cost per liter of milk. And I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it varies pretty tremendously between farms too. The ones that are high on this range are not very happy uh, with some of those numbers. So we need to find a way to get more of those farms operating uh, towards that lower cost substrate per liter milk. And I, I've uh, heard some farmers vigorously debating their, their, uh, the, uh, the people involved in the, uh, the delivery side of, of some of that substrate. And it's a, uh, and you have to be a, uh, you have to be a negotiator, I think, in order to, uh, you know, get, uh, get, get what you need when you, when you need it. Um, I think that's I think that's true, and I think the other uh, the other thing is is having a little bit of consideration towards the logistics. The farmers that have had better success are the ones that have some kind of surge capacity for storage. A lot of the new barns going in, they've dedicated the last section of the barn towards you know storage, so a truck can tip it in. If someone's operating on just in time delivery, like I need shavings tomorrow, so the truck needs to come today, uh, that is pretty challenging for people. Because if they need, and I think I even just used the word shavings again, um, but I should be saying sawdust. If you need sawdust uh, tomorrow and the truck doesn't come tomorrow and that pack starts getting really wet and dying, then you are into these challenges we're talking about. It could take you a while to get that yes. sorted once the... Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, you're we, we, had, that. we had a farmer, um, their farm uh, lost heat last November. They had uh, washed uh, their farm and actually have power washed it and the moisture from washing the barn uh, was enough to stop the pack from heating and they didn't get heat again until the spring so uh, and they had, they'd been having glowing success to that point in time yeah these are things we're learning along along the way you're you're man you're managing a biological entity almost uh, in that in that yeah way. And, and back to the comment i made before about you know cow managers managing the pack i look at the pack as being another living farm animal for lack of a better uh, term that needs to be taken care of. And then can you talk about uh, milk quality, kind of, uh, you know, milk quality in the bulk tank somatic cell count uh, early on? I know there's some challenges with this. Uh, wh where are we at as far as managing milk quality out of composting backgrounds? Uh, I think it's still variable, if we're being honest. And again, I am not an utter health guy, so I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to stake that ground. But I will tell you that we have testimonials from farmers who are part of our project. And again, 
we're just starting into the data and I don't want to say things without the data. We did correlations three summers ago already. We did some bulk tank measures and uh, they, you know, just based on stated reports from the farms and there is absolutely a relationship to cleanliness of the cows. Okay. So we know some of those relationships exist. We know that uh, some of those bulk tank measures correlate to moisture of the pack and uh, temperature history. So basically the lower the moisture or being within the ideal range at least, uh, and the higher the temperature, the better those utter health and milk quality parameters are. Absolutely, we have some farmers that are struggling with milk quality or have struggled. Many of them have overcome it. And uh, there's had to be in relationships, you know, between the veterinarian and identifying problem cows and getting them out and managing that pack aggressively. So my point is we have some people doing exceptionally well, great production, uh, great utter health, and we have other people that uh, this may not be the system for them long term. So what else do we need to know yet about uh, composting pack barns? It feels like I've been, uh, uh, I've been writing about them for a long time, but really in the, you know, the, the history of, of uh, dairy housing, they're not that, uh, that, they haven't been around that, that long. What, what do we need to learn yet? And that might come into that, uh, the work you're still wanting to do, to do through the university. And, and yes, it comes to that work we uh, hopefully will do the, with the university because there are still relationships between cow behavior we need to understand. Uh, we also need to understand uh, the code of practice for dairy is under review or uh, renewal at this point in time. And uh, the previous code of practice had a very standard number. And we have some data also that we've collected on farm that shows there is a dose response type of relationship between square footage and some of these performance parameters. And, and so we need to have a long, hard think about whether 120 square feet per cow is the number we want to hang our hat on, or is there, we have, we have other barns, frankly, because of the way uh, some of those measurements are made and it becomes a technical point on how you measure that, uh, that we could argue maybe running at slightly square, uh, lower square footages. And frankly, they have better performance. So we need to have, uh, the scientific community is going to have to have a robust discussion about is 120 square feet the right number? And the reason that matters is, is because building a compost bedded pack barn for 120 square feet per cow becomes a disincentive for someone coming out of a tie stall. So we need to be really careful. That was the number that was the right, the right one a few years ago, but we need to be uh, open to the idea uh, that maybe there's, uh, a performance standard we need to be looking at versus just uh, the tape measure. So that's okay. that's one thing, John. And I guess uh, one of the other things uh, I'll go back to is we need to understand um, we have some outlier packs, you know, some of the places we've gone. Uh, for example, where people have used them for dry cows or for young stock. And there are things happening in those packs. Uh, we had one just a few weeks ago uh, my colleague Tom Wright and our summer student uh, were out measuring it and it was the highest temperature of any of the packs we've measured this summer and it was in a dry cow pack and I could give you conspiracy theory but you know a relationship to moisture and all this stuff uh, because that dry cow is not drinking as much water but they were breaking all the other rules about substrate addition and uh, frequency of tilling and so we really need to understand uh, those relationships between moisture carbon, uh, cow traffic, water consumption, um, as we go forward trying to solve some of the, the challenging farms. Good, and is there anything else you think we, uh, you have, that you've seen, seen recently that farmers should know about uh, composting pack barns these days? I think people just need to keep an open mind to it. Um, that's what people should know. Uh, I know there's some people who have formed the opinion that they cannot work. They know some neighbor or some person down the road a few years ago who had one that was a disaster. And I'm not going to deny that some of them have been challenging, but I'm hoping people can open their minds because, you know, there's this intersection around, uh, you know, cow behavior, some other vision for the dairy industry beyond just free stalls as we know them and tie stalls as we know them. And maybe this can be, you know, I don't think every barn in Ontario should be a compost bedded pack. That's not where I'm at, but let's leave it on the table as a good solution for part of the industry. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk to us today. Thank you very much, John. Mm -hmm.